I was 12 years old, going to movies, sneaking into movies, watching movies I shouldn't have. And Halloween was the pinnacle of all of them. And action. Over the course of the franchise, I've heard so many crazy ideas and pitches. David and Danny's take was very original and different. It's something I hadn't heard of before, that nobody had thought of before. We didn't want to remake Halloween. That had already been done before. They'd walk the line between reinventing something new and bowing to the old. We're here today to interview a patient spent the last 40 years in captivity. What if Michael had been captured at the end of one? What does that do to the story? How does it change it? I knew I was going to say yes on page four. We just thought Laurie Strode is a pretty interesting way in. Why don't we find a new timeline that could connect to the first movie and we can explore a different path for her? To me, it's really about these three generations of women who are deeply affected by this incident that happened in 1978. Three strong women taking on a unstoppable force. I have tried to protect you and prepare you. Finding the arc of Lori's journey 40 years in the future, where she's basically a character frozen in time. Very broken person, but a determined person. We have to hunt him down. It's been a really awesome experience to watch her revisit this character. Let's say the second she turns, starts to turn. OK. David loves doing this. First time I watched Halloween as a kid, I was so traumatized. For me, it's coming full circle. Dad, look out! It's being in charge of my own demons. It's taking man of my nightmare. And for once, I get to tell him what to do. I'm gonna have Marion stand in the door right here with her back to us talking on the phone until this shadow has passed. And then he comes in. I've written almost 50 episodes of TV and a few screenplays, and all that time I've barely killed anyone. And if they were killed, they deserved it. And it's weird to kill innocent people. That's the fun of it. You know, they are going about their day, and they don't know they're about to get killed. My favorite death sequence is Oscar getting impaled on a fence. It's based on an idea I'd been haunted by for 15 years. Come in, stab, and then pull. And I've thought for over a decade, if I made a horror movie, I would have to include that moment. David helped me conjure up that fear, and he got like right up in my face and everything. Please, dear God, help me! Help me! I had no idea how hard it was to do a death scene. Screaming took the wind out of my sails for a week. Help me! Help me! Not only was it a little emotionally like, whoa, what just happened, but I lost my voice as well. Set and action. Help me! Help me! Nice. Good take a breather. Really nice. As soon as you're kind of dropped into those circumstances, and you have somebody dressed up as Mike Myers, and you have somebody with a knife, a part of you kind of naturally kicks into that, like, adrenaline mode. You were standing right there in, in the door. Halloween in 1978 was a milestone for horror. Something about the simplicity of the first Halloween makes it timeless. We weren't really allowed to be watching it, but we stayed up later than everyone else. And I was like, screw you, man, I'm going to see it. It just, just bit into me. It scared the shit out of me. Nightmares about it forever. What we wanted to do was make a movie, and we wanted to make a scary movie. And that's all we cared about. Camera set, we're rolling, we're rolling, we're Stylistically, we tried to approach it in honor of the film that Carpenter created and trying to re-engineer that in a way, put a twist on that. We were back on shady streets in Haddonfield and kids and trick-or-treaters, and it felt very reminiscent. David Gordon Green has taken all that has come before and taken it a giant step forward. I think they had the tone of it right, right from the beginning. A lot of thought, a lot of care. Filmmakers who speak a creative language with each other. You scramble, and then you start to scramble, and then we'll cut. Go! 
Great. And then that's as far as we go. It's a really special, specific mindset that everyone shares coming to this project for their love of the project. Happy Halloween, Michael. Lori Strode is singular in her purpose. I pray every night that he would escape so I can kill him. Wants to face her demon eye to eye. Lori's scarred from the past. She can't move forward in her life. Everything else has sort of fallen away from her because she knows Michael Myers will come again. It was 1978, and we just wanted to make a movie. I was going to be a police officer before I became an actor, and I fell into it. All the girls in the original Halloween are really fine actresses, but Jamie Lee has a special quality to her. She has an energy and an innocence and a drive. She's an incredible woman. I just am in awe of her every day. I saw him in the shape. You're going to obviously put the gun, you turn back around. I'm in good position. Everybody's happy? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Jamie Lee Curtis has so much energy, and she's so committed, and she's so protective of this character. And you're going to come and say, Allison, here. Michael's here. Get downstairs. Really great. So let's break something. She's showing all of us who these people are, what this town is like, what it felt like. She enters the room and brings 100% from a fight scene. That's so crazy. To a dramatic scene, to a scream scene. In 1978, the first time I had ever screamed in the movie Halloween, I had never practiced screaming. And then I hear John say, action. Jamie just puts it out there. Perfect for the movie I made. And now, all these years later, she's perfect for David Gordon Green's movie. Laurie Strode wants to end her own story rather than have her story ended for her. Hey! Goodbye, Michael. The most important thing about setting a mood in a horror movie is to write scary music. We used John Carpenter's 1978 film as our creative foundation. Carpenter made some of my favorite films, and it was nerve-wracking to go in and pitch to one of your idols. His cell phone goes off while we're talking to him, and it's the theme from Halloween, and that's when I realized where I am and who I'm talking to. Original Halloween basically had a bunch of equipment and one guy in this score you have a bunch of equipment and three guys, so it's three times the score. <laughs> I got this idea for the Halloween main theme from my father, and he taught me 5-4 time. And so I sat down at the piano, and I just came up with a little riff. So that 5-4 time, and then moving down half steps. In the new Halloween, we made it as scary as we could. We knew we wanted to use the themes from the right. first movie. So before we even got started, we organized how we were going to arrange it. We have the original score, which was done in 1978. So what we're doing is building on that. The original was done with just my dad working with synthesizers and a piano. So the way that we're doing pays homage to the original and, and keeps the feel. I don't think you can have a real Halloween movie without my dad. Cody's more precise on the keyboard than I am. He knows what's going on. Kids in my class knew who my dad is, and they said, you got to play the theme for me. So I've been playing that all my life. <laughs> I'm basically just 
subtract the score out of it. It's a feel situation, improvisational situation. When he gets into his element, that's the most fun for me. He's been waiting for me. We're building with brand new sounds, brand new techniques. So I do the experimenting on my own and then present sounds that I think John might like. So sampling old synths and then John can play them on the keyboard. And get approximate sounds of what I dealt with. So that's Daniel's magic. He's the sound man in this whole thing. We would start and then suddenly five hours would have gone by, and it was kind of a stream of consciousness. To work with John, who created the original, and then carry that on to work with David, it's really been a great experience for us. The sound of Halloween is so iconic. The three of them combined to create a, a once-in-a-lifetime Carpenter score for us. All right. Yes. Michael Myers, in that mask, represents pure evil. A character who is between a human being and the supernatural. There's something scary about someone committing those kind of violent acts with, like, no emotion at all, and that's what that mask does. <laughs> you can project your own things that frighten you onto that mask. You feel it, don't you, Michael? I hired Christopher Nelson, an amazing Oscar-winning effects makeup artist, and said, let's make the mask. 40 years later, it's going to have cracks and deteriorated a little bit, but let's keep that beautiful, melancholy character. Approaching the mask had to have the same expression. The way the dirt collected on the nose and the mouth and on the neck and the way it warped specifically. That original mask had an expression of tragedy, of blankness. Where it came from was John Carpenter sent Tommy Wallace out to get some Halloween masks in the first one, try to figure out what this guy was going to wear. And he got this Captain Kirk mask. He showed it to him, and they really liked it. And he goes, well, change it. So Tommy Wallace ripped the sideburns off of it, took the eyebrows off of it, cut the eye holes bigger and spray painted it white and sprayed the hair brown. And it ended up being this very strange mannequin-like, you know, soulless, almost great white shark of a human. When he puts that mask on, he changes. The lack of any human response is really quite terrifying. <laughs> When the mask goes on, I'm in an altered state. There's this switch that goes off, and all of a sudden, my breathing changes. It's not something I'm really in touch with outside of doing this. I want him to disappear into the essence of evil. Two, one. The mask is this perfect storm of all these things coming together to create this iconic thing. <laughs> I'm Jamie Lee Curtis. I am John Carpenter. I'm David Gordon Green. I'm Jason Blum. Why are you making this movie, Jason Blum? I mean, it really started with you. Halloween has outlasted every other scary movie. There were some good incarnations and some bad incarnations, but it needed the perfect incarnation. I'd like to give credit to David and his partner, Danny, for coming up with this story. 100%. That's what made it. How did you know? Because. With all due respect, horror is not at the top of your oeuvre. Horror is not, not yet. Not yet. If you're a great director, you can make a great horror movie, even if you've never made a great horror movie before. Action camera, go from this blood, raise that, and take you here. A lot of our movies, we hire directors who haven't made horror movies before. I've been trying to get him to work with us, and he's politely declined. But I sent him an email and said, what do you think of Halloween? When I got Jason's email, I remember very, very vividly, notion of Halloween 
made my legs start to shake mm. as if I was standing on the edge of something oh, very intimidating. Really? I love that. And I knew from that moment that this was going to happen. And it became this passion project for me to try to write something that would appeal to you, to then appeal to you, to then appeal to the world. That became extraordinarily exciting in the blink of an eye. What's interesting to me is I find the two of you are very similar people in both your personalities, your backgrounds, and what I really responded to is the fact that you create the exact same community of creativity. Anything you want to play with, uh, Jamie, on this one? Okay. Was Halloween your favorite horror movie? It was, yeah. Most people say Halloween's their favorite scary movie. Now, why do you think that is? It's because I think the way we put it together, you hadn't seen anything like that at the but time. what do you mean? What were the horror movies before that that people were using? Like Christmas, you remember right. that movie? Right. Bob Clark? Right, yeah. yeah. right. Uh, they always had an explanation. Right. They, the music always told what was gonna happen right. before it happened. Right. As opposed to what we did was the instant it happens so that you're ready for it. Yeah. And they didn't use widescreen and the steady cam, Which was new. It was brand new then. Yeah. And people hadn't seen anything like it. I think that was the reason. I think uh, ultimately, Deborah Hill, right. who was co-writer and producer, right. had a lot to do, I'm guessing, with the girls in the movie. And you see, there is this ubiquitous sense of middle America, the every girl. Laurie Strode is the every girl. She lives in this little town, and you create this beautific reality. Right. And then you introduce a monster, but the monster is in human form. He is this enigmatic human. Right. You know, it's a human mass with no backstory. With no affect. So he isn't a monster that is not real. And we know he's a human being because we've seen it at the beginning of the movie. And I think it's that. I think it's this simplicity of this quiet place with these very real, sweet people doing their daily life. Right. and the introduction of what we learned from Donald Pleasance, which is pure evil. What truth. you've done with this movie is reintroduce Lori back into the story. You've brought her back to the center of the story, right. her family. Right, of course. So you've established something, I call them hello women, because they are now united. For a next story. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I think there's more story to tell because of Jamie's character. He's waited for me. I've waited for him.